here. Uh, I'm at the Media Lab, by the way, uh, and I direct a uh, innovation initiative there. And it thinks about three things. Uh, the visionary work uh, involves, uh, because I'm an architect and have been an urban designer, it involves me thinking about uh, how art, culture, technology, and communications can converge uh, in the interest of uh, stimulating a creative economy, which can in turn stimulate uh, you know, uh, workforce development and the quality of life. And I'm particularly interested in inner cities, although I've worked on a city in China and a city in Japan. Uh, the second thing that I do, because my background is in film and television, and, uh, and one, of, one thing that many people may, one institution uh, that I've been associated with is WGBH at one point in time, I was one of the program managers there. After my first stint at MIT, I went to WGBH, <laughs> and uh, was responsible for the uh, production and development and broadcast of, of the schedule. Uh, so I think about another space, uh, which is why I was on the red eye. Um, and that space is uh, new storytelling modalities, new production methodologies, uh, and new distribution platforms in the film and television space. So I'm uh, actually advising Google. Uh, the third thing that I'm doing is uh, I'm actually uh, establishing innovation centers uh, in different places. Uh, three of them will open this fall. One will be at Morehouse College, one will be at uh, Hampton uh, University, uh, and the other one will be in North Carolina Central, and then there'll be Howard, and then there will be Spellman. Uh, I've been invited, in fact, I was on the phone this morning in the White House, I've been invited to come there to speak to 25 uh, college presidents about taking this systematology and this methodology and implanting it at, at another range of colleges. On Sunday, I was with the president of a, a university in Africa. Someone is going there. And while I was in the car, I was on the phone with someone from rural Arkansas who was a colleague at MIT who wants to build one. But that's not what I want to talk about. I just want to give you a, a that view, and I think it's very important to know how and where I started. It started for me with my greatest teacher, who was my grandfather. Okay? Incredible. Saint to me. And the first measure of confidence that I ever gained in this man, you know, uh, was when I was about, I can't remember the age, but I know I was very young. And I can remember wearing short pants. And he said to me, as we were about to cross a bridge, he said, get up on the rail and walk it. I said, but Grandpa, I can't do that. He said, yes, you can. He said, you need to know one thing, that if you fall in, I'm coming in after you. And I walked away. OK, now, archery, when I was about 11 or 12 years old, <laughs> Somehow I connected to archery. I have no real explanation for it. I could put an arrow in a bullseye, and I could then split the arrow. So I started to jog my memory as of late. Where did I get that kind of focus? Okay. When I was in elementary school, my grandfather taught me how to put my hand down on the table, face down, and then take a knife and go in between each of the fingers. <laughs> now that's what he did. Now it was curious to me because he was missing half a finger. <laughs> okay, so, but you know, this is a man I trusted, so I figured practice, 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 slow, then faster, slow, then faster, and I finally got that down. I still do it sometimes today. But that's a focus thing. Another thing he taught me, which was fascinating, he would put an egg in boiling water, and he taught me how to reach into that, that pan and take that egg out of the water. And so you have to completely focus, you have to be like tapped right into it, and you got to go for it. So that's another focus issue. So I think that somehow, you know, I developed an ability uh, to focus. 
And I, I, attribute, I attribute that to him. Now, the other half of the archery story is I wanted a boat. And the rule in that house was we don't buy toys. We make them. So I never, ever was allowed to buy a toy. So now, the issue of an archer's boat, the thing that I want more than anything, comes up. And so my grandfather would walk through the woods and saw. You know, because tools were everywhere in our house. And he had this saw. We would walk. And we walked for weeks till we found what we thought was the perfect boat. Cut it down, right? We take it home. Now, this is where we aggravated my grandmother. Because <laughs> my grandfather said, we've got to soak it in the bathtub for two weeks with linseed oil. <laughs> my grandmother was thoroughly aggravated because she could not take it back. Okay, so that, but we finally, you know, it was like, and so then finally the wood was seasoned and the carving went on and we made a bow. But there were other things and let's see, it was a, uh, a slingshot, okay, it wasn't just, you know, everybody had this little wire frame made out of coat hangers with some rubber bands on it. We had to find a piece of wood, we had to carve it, and instead of rubber bands we had uh, inner tube, you know, rubber inner tube stuff. This thing could kill an elephant. <laughs> it was just one awesome slingshot. And then when it came time to make the go-kart, you know, I had the Mercedes. I had the fastest go-kart. You know, uh, we, we talked about aerodynamics, smaller wheels on the front, bigger wheels on the back, steering system. It was longer, sleeker, and it was the fastest go-kart neighborhood. When it came time to, to, to make a sailboat, it wasn't just a boat. It was the architecture of the structural aspect of it that was then covered with metal, that was then soldered. And the thing was about this long, but it was just like, it was like a battle sheet. And, but that was the kind of experience that I had. The encyclopedias, okay, every day I come home from school, he's got something. You gotta think about this. You gotta know this. Popular Mechanics Magazine, Popular Electrics Magazine, always thumbing through those, okay. When I was 16, I got a job at one of the society houses at Harvard. Okay, I had a little mustache, they're faking my age, <laughs> got the white jacket, the black pants. And I stand behind the bar and I listen to these Harvard boys tell me stories about their lives. They ask me about their dating problems. I'm 16, right? <laughs> and I'm thinking, they ask me about their dating problems. <laughs> and then they get drunk and they throw roast beef on the wall. They throw potatoes on the wall. And I say, if this is college, I can do this. <laughs> I can do this. So my ambition became to go to Harvard. All right? I was inside, I'm seeing this, and this, these are Harvard students? Yeah, so, I went to a test boys high school in Boston. There were two test schools, Boston Latin and Boston Tech. There were in a graduating class of about 190 10 African-Americans. Right. I didn't like school. I liked school for two things. I liked it for, actually three things. I liked it for lunch. I liked it for track. And I liked it for, for accountability, drawing. That's it. And I would duck school on an average of one day a week and go to the movies. Have my little girlfriend, with me, you got a little lunches. Movie opens at 11.30, 35 cents, we're in. There was nothing that relatable for me. You say A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And because of the way I'm learning at home, I wonder why, you, why am I here for 40 minutes for you to explain this to me? It doesn't make sense. So I would always try to tweak it. And by tweaking it, it would obviously impact my grades. So it came to the senior year, 
And uh, by then, the idea of going to college was interesting to me because people who went to church with me had gone ahead, were coming home. They had the new dances. They had the new fraternity here. They're getting all the girls. And I got to go. So the guidance counselor, his name is O'Brien. He calls me into the guidance, the guidance office. He says, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go to college. And here's what he said to me. He said, you would be better off going to the Navy to be a sheet metal worker. That's what he told me. As God would have, two weeks later, another guidance counselor came. His name was John O'Brien, and he was African American. So there's a school now named after him. He became the first uh, elected school board, black elected school board chairman in Boston. And I had the pleasure of giving him his first fundraiser. But he came into the school. He called me into the office. He asked me the same question. What do you want to do with your life? I said, I want to go to Harvard. And he looked at me and he kind of smiled. He said, well, I'll tell you what. You're a curiosity. You test in the top 1% of this school, but your grades just don't reflect it. I had to be honest with him. I said, I just don't like it. It doesn't challenge me. It doesn't do anything for me. Because I was being homeschooled. And I only came to class because I had to. He said to me, if you'll work this year, I'll get you in the college. So he said, I'll do the other age. The other age was Howard University. So with Howard, Howard changed my life. Civil rights movement. I don't know if you just saw, uh, if anybody saw Freedom Summer. Has anybody seen that? The American Experience two-hour special on PBS. Well, I was I was one of those guys with the long hair, coveralls, Delta, Mississippi, uh, registering people who had never registered to vote since the 1860s. The making and doing, the belief, the fact that John O'Brien could see something in me that I could not see in myself, and even Mel King, who we both know, who was a youth worker at the time, who could see things in me that I couldn't see in myself, made a difference in my life. The fact that I had a grandfather who was a tinkerer, a maker, a doer, who taught me to sew, cook, him my pants, iron, spit shine my shoes, and it went on and on and on. And I think uh, a great deal of my life has been devoted to doing things outside of that academic environment in the interest of encouraging young people from underrepresented groups to somehow find their way into the spectrum of hope and possibility. And I do it mostly now in the technology space. I've done it in the arts. I haven't touched the film in a year. This is my devotion and my passion right now. And it, it is beginning to take hold. It's a movement. And I feel very good about that. Thank you for having me get to share some time with you.